I'm Brendan Coogan, freelance reporter and petrol head, but now fully committed electro head. This is EVTV, and for this episode, we're coming to you from Turin, Italy. Hello and welcome to EVTV, the series that explains all you need to know on the subject of electric vehicles. We know that over one in two new car sales by 2040 is going to be an EV and with advances in research and technology that could happen a lot sooner. It's all being driven, as always, by the increasingly exciting and popular Formula E series. And we go green under the light. I'm Adrien de Dieu from DHL, experts in auto mobility and EV logistics. Whether you work in EV or battery manufacturing, manage a car dealership, or any business involved with the future of electric vehicles, this series is made for you. I'm once again here at the DHL Innovation Center near Bonn. In our last episode, we looked at sustainable solution for sustainable EV value chain. In this episode, we're again looking at discovering how industry is adapting and planning for the future. As always, we'll be hearing from experts from all around the world to share with us their enthusiasm and EV knowledge. As you know, the first electric vehicle took the road in 1881. But did you know that in 1899, 90% of New York City taxi cabs were actually electric vehicles? And in the same year, electric cars actually outsold all other types of cars, such as gas and steam-powered vehicles. Due mainly to the cost of production and global adoption of the fossil fuels, by 1935, the EV was officially dead. Until now, of course. EV innovation is once again moving at an incredible pace, faster than we expected or could have ever imagined. Governments around the world are putting plans in place to ban new fossil fuel driven vehicles within 10 to 15 years. And with the cost of production reducing significantly, the likelihood of EVs suffering the same fate as those in the 20th century is highly unlikely. Most of the major OEMs have plans to convert 20 to 50% of their capacity to EV by 2025, which increases to 40 to 70% by 2030. Jaguar, for example, plans to sell only electric cars from 2025. For Volvo and Nissan, it is from 2030. General Motor will only produce electric vehicles by 2035. Volkswagen says 70% of its sales will be electric by 2030. And Ford says its production line will only produce electric vehicles in Europe from 2030. So how are the value chain players adapting their operations and business models to the surge of EVs from battery suppliers to charging infrastructure? Well, we'll try to answer some of these questions later. But in the meantime... Now, there's a lot of talk about the democratization of charging and how energy can be shared by creating networks of charging points for residential and business properties. With more countries committed to phasing out fossil fuel vehicles, is there still a place for fuel forecourts in an EV future? Will we still see BP, Arrow, Shell, Chevron, Total and private filling stations on the roadside? Considered Opinion says, well, yes, probably, but they will be very different places from those we experience today. 
to find out just how different. I'm joined online by Alexander Jung, Electrification Director for Aral in Germany, part of the BP Group. Alexander, welcome to EVTV. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. You're joining us from uh, Lübeck in uh, the north of Germany at what looks like a little glimpse of the future. First of all, tell us a little bit about the facility that you're, you're at. Yeah, I'm at one of our 2,400 RL four courts in Germany and uh, we offer charging and fueling vehicles under the same canopy here. Furthermore, the site has got a river to go convenience store. We want to help decarbonize road traffic. We want to help the world get to net zero. And over the next few years, there will be a mix of different engine types and both fuel and electricity will be needed. And we want to offer both at our retail stations where possible, even under the same canopy. Tell me a little bit about how quickly cars can recharge there. The chargers here can uh, dispense 300 kilowatts. That means provided the car's battery can do it as well. You can recharge 300 kilometers of range in about 10 minutes. That's absolutely incredible. That is ultra fast. What are the challenges you faced when it came to converting traditional forecourts into charging stations? Well, for most forecourts, it is possible to um, be converted into charging stations, but it takes time. And that is our biggest challenge. We would love to roll out our charging network even faster, but there have been cases where we had to wait for over a year for a building permit. So what plans do BP and Aral have for this kind of expansion? Well, at the moment, uh, BP Group operates around 11,000 charge points globally. And uh, by 2030, we want to operate 70,000 charge points globally. That's quite impressive. We've talked about the democratization of charging because not everybody can charge at home. So how important is this facility and does it form part of a, a, a wider policy, a wider program for, for different places to charge as well as forecourts? Well, we believe that um, ultra fast charging is the future and it is important to offer people ultra fast charge speeds because there are people who don't have a dedicated uh, place where to park their car, who cannot own a wall box. And those EV drivers rely on charging on the go and they don't want to stand somewhere with their vehicle waiting for an hour or so until it uh, has completed charging. So ultra fast charging where you can charge a few hundred kilometers range within a few minutes is the future and helps uh, democratize charging. Alexander, I feel like we've had a glimpse of the future and, and it looks bright and it certainly looks electric. I hope you're not too cold. Thank you for joining us so early this morning. Thank you. It's quite feasible that the overall number of converted four-court charging stations will continue to increase in the short to medium term. Longer term, however, is less certain. One additional factor may be the needs of commercial fleets, where journeys are long and time short. Now, did you know? The process of bringing any electric vehicle being produced today to market is less about the traditional auto manufacturing processes and more about combining auto engineering with the talents and knowledge of tech companies. Established OEMs have had to change quickly to a new way of working, whilst at the same time keep ahead of the trend curve in what customers need and what is expected from next generation electric vehicles. To discover how one such leading auto manufacturer is evolving to meet the demands of electrification, I travelled to Turin to visit global automotive giant Stellantis, whose brands include Fiat, Chrysler, Citroën, Opel, Peugeot and Maserati.
500E, the latest incarnation of an iconic car. Now, I wonder if you movie buffs have figured out where I am. I'm at the world famous Lingotto Fiat rooftop test track here in Turin, Italy. Seen from one of my favorite films, the classic Italian job. But thankfully, I'm not here to pull off the heist of the century. I'm here to talk to Gabriele Catacchio, who is the global e-mobility communication manager at Stellantis. And I started by asking him what's driving their plans for electrification. Yeah, so there are some mega trends that we are uh, looking at that are related to urbanization in particular. So more people living in city centers, more goods moving in city centers due to the e-commerce increase in the last years. So, uh, of course, this is causing an increase of pollution in the cities and we want to answer, we want to tackle this problem because, I mean, we take care of the planet. So that's why we think that the answer is electrification. And also, I mean, we need to take care of what is coming out from the institution. So think about the European Union that has announced in July last year a target of uh, minus 55% of CO2 reduction in 2030 versus 1919. But it's happening this, exactly the same in the United States, in India, Brazil, Japan. But of course, I mean, this is something that is happening globally for Stellantis and we are present in all the region with all our brands. You've touched on brands there. Before we talk about the plan and how you're going to reduce your emissions, first of all, tell us about how hard it is with Stellantis because you have so many different brands to get electrification into that DNA, which sometimes is, is historic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have 14 iconic brands uh, with uh, a lot of heritage uh, coming from the uh, two legacies. So the ex uh, Fiat Chrysler Automobile and ex PSA Group. Uh, so think about Jeep, Alfa Romeo, Peugeot, DS, Opel. So very different brands with a specific DNA. We think that electrification could be a way to enhance this DNA, offering new services, uh, new upgraded products to our customers based on their request. Yeah, bringing them together in a way as well, because you're all part of the same family. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so back to the plan and how you're going to achieve these targets. The targets are formidable. How are you going to do it? Yeah, so first of all, we are working on four new BEV platforms. So platform intended to be used for battery electrical vehicle. So for platforms that will allow us to reach uh, very important targets in terms of performance. So the first one is the electric range. We will be available up to 800 kilometers of electric range with our new platforms. And in parallel, the charging speed is another important point we are working on. We, we target to reach 32 kilometers per minute of charging speed. I mean, this is an amazing number. Uh, important to answer the question coming from our customers. In parallel to do that, we are working on the software side. So we have announced that from now on to 2025, we will invest 30 billion euro working on both software and electrification. So the software uh, will help us to do all this plan, to realize this plan, because it is the brain uh, behind the electrical vehicle. There are big sums, big investments, and it's not just about the targets, but you have to do it at pace. Is that, is that gonna be through partnerships? Exactly. I mean, uh, the par partnership is the right word. So uh, we think that uh, in order to, I mean, facilitate this switch to electromobility, we need to work together with other companies from other industries, but also with institutions. Uh, in particular, I want to mention one important partnership that we have with NOAA, uh, uh, that is uh, an, uh, a company working in the energy sector. We have created a joint venture that is called Free to Move is Solution. We are offering, thanks to this preferred partner that we have, a specific customized solution for charging, both for private uh, charging, so home charging solution, but also for public. And think about that we have a big program with them, a project that is called Atlante, uh, that is intending to build in south of Europe, so in Italy, uh, Spain, Portugal and France, up to 36,000 charging stations from now on to 2030. Wow. With dedicated discounts and services for Stellantis customers. Ah, okay, so if you're part of the family, you get preferential treatment. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay, I understand. That's a deal. Um, how important is innovation? Because we, we've talked about the present and the short term, but there are exciting things coming down the line. Yeah, 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 absolutely. We have in particular two big programs uh, we are working on regarding the future, but I mean, they're happening right now. So the first one is the vehicle to grid. Uh, vehicle to grid means that vehicles are connected to the grid uh, uh, bidirectionally. So they can ask for power to the grid, but they can also give power to the grid when needed. So think of that in Italy in 2030, I mean, studies are saying that there will be around 6 million electrical vehicles. They will be uh, able to offer 60 gigawatt power to the electrical grid of the whole country. And the peak power of the grid is around 40 gigawatt. 
so it would be a huge number and this vehicle can help the grid to be stabilized in case of blackouts uh, uh, in different periods of the year. So this is one of the uh, two programs. Very program. clever, very yeah. clever. If you think it's, a, it's like having an enormous battery you can just flick on at exactly. any moment. Exactly, and we're running, I mean, the test uh, already here in Turin at the Dross Stockyard. So we will have in the next months uh, more than 700 vehicles connected to the grid in order to test this, this technology. Okay. And so the, the next exciting innovation which you told me about is charging on the move. How, how, tell me yeah. about that, it sounds incredible. Yeah, yeah, we have another project that is called Arena del Futuro. So we are working on the future, but it's happening now with a lot of different partners. Uh, so private uh, companies, public companies, and also universities. So we are working a lot with universities and students. Uh, it's a program intended to test the so-called dynamic wireless power transfer. So a technology that allows vehicles to be recharged while driving. So they are moving on the streets and thanks to coils that are placed below the asphalt, they can be recharged. So it's a, I mean, a direct answer to the problem of battery sides and charging solution. Excellent. Well, listen, you've got some serious targets. You've got to crack on. We're really grateful you joined us today. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. I've made my way over from Lingotto to E Village, a location chosen by Stellantis to promote the group's vision of sustainable mobility. This showcase has been set up within Greenpea, the first green retail park in the world. E Village is laid out on the ground floor of the five-story Greenpea building, a shopping centre dedicated to changing our relationship with energy, movement, our homes, clothing and leisure. Well, I'm here to talk to Eric Laforge, who is the head of the LCV division for Stellantis Europe. Eric, welcome to EVTV and thank you for joining us. Thank you. First of all, a word about where we are, this uh, great location. What, what's its purpose? So this location, first of all, is located close to the Lingotto, the historical plant, uh, the first big plant of uh, uh, Fiat uh, in the city centre of, uh, of Turin. Then we uh, created uh, uh, two years ago the E-Village, uh, a place where we have uh, dedicated 1,300 square meters to display our offer of uh, electrified vehicles. Plug-in hybrid vehicles, full uh, um, BEV uh, vehicles, you have the entire palette mm. of products uh, of Stellantis uh, in the field of... Uh, it's, it's only just occurred to me, but it's, it's about perhaps winning the PR battle and making people come in and walk around them and get used to electric vehicles. They might not buy one for some years, but they, they come and see them and experience them, yeah? Absolutely. We have a, a new customer target on electrified vehicles at the moment, and many of them, they are not willing to enter in a traditional showroom no. to uh, buy a car. They will do it in internet. Uh, here, they just want to touch the product, maybe to uh, have some answers to their doubts about uh, electrified vehicles, range, uh, yeah. uh, warranty, and so on. So it's more a moment to, to have an exchange with the customer, potential customer. Let's talk shop about commercial vehicles and light commercial vehicles. What is the whole division of LCVs going to do to reduce emissions? It's going to be a challenge, yeah? It's a huge challenge. Uh, so uh, uh, we are an industry where diesel engines have been the an only answer for decades. In the coming five to seven years, we will completely shift from diesel, some gasoline, but mainly diesel, to full electric vehicles and maybe something else. But 80% um, of our vehicles in 2028 will be full BEV uh, vehicles. So how are you going to go about that? It's, it's a huge challenge for you, surely. You... So it's a huge challenge and we will have to face it in a very short period of time. Yeah. Since 70 years, this automotive industry That's didn't awesome. move a lot. But now in 10 years, we have to move from a fuel uh, or better internal uh, combustion engine at 100 percent to uh, 80 up to 100 percent of uh, yeah. uh, electrified vehicles. So it's a challenge really stimulating, uh, but that obliges us uh, to rethink everything. I was talking to Gabriel early on about this, about the, the number of light commercial vehicles you have in the Stellantis group. Is it hard because they each have their own DNA and identity to, 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 to approach it as a one size fits all? Or? So, first of all, all commercial vehicles in Stellantis have already an electrified uh, okay. solution, an electrified uh, version. Uh, so we are already in the future. 
Um, tomorrow it's clear that what we will have to face is also to uh, manage it with uh, five brands in Europe, Vauxhall, Opel, uh, Peugeot, Citroën and Fiat Professional. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's just complicating, but it's uh, also a, a huge opportunity for us because uh, in fact at the end uh, with Stellantis we are uh, a national brand quite in each country in, uh, in Europe. Now, obviously, we are seeing lots of exposure for electric vehicles, cars mainly. Does it ever feel in the LCV sector that it's a little bit less sexy? So you, maybe you are uh, telling it because you saw uh, 500e, a Cinquecento electrical uh, version, and it's really sexy. But don't you think that our Ducato uh, electrified version is not sexy? That's the right answer, and I wouldn't expect anything less from you. Eric, thank you for joining thank us. You. It's been a real insight into what Salantis is doing. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Now, let's see what's happening elsewhere in the world of EVs. Ill-informed opinion suggests the more EVs that are on the road, the more they'll rely on dirtier power sources in order to meet charging demands. A recent report from independent global energy experts RMI reputes this. They state, smart charging technology allows drivers to charge their cars at optimized times, when electricity is cheapest, and when renewable sources like wind and solar are on stream. RMI argues that leaving cars plugged in longer also helps as it creates more flexibility to charge when grid emissions are lower. As Adrienne mentioned earlier, the EV revolution is happening much quicker than anticipated. It's now clear that the market has reached a tipping point with the cost of ownership of electric vehicles now pretty much comparable with their internal combustion engine counterparts. Great news for the planet, but in practical terms, this means that all sectors of the EV vehicle value chain have had significantly less time to prepare. The logistics industry itself needs to supercharge its efforts to ensure that it's capable of meeting the needs of the wider industry. Logistics organisations will need to design a higher level of flexibility into the chain so that they're able to ensure uninterrupted supply. They'll need to have systems in place to expand and contract their services depending on the demands and the availability of EV components, batteries and raw materials. Well, that's nearly it. In this episode, we've covered how industry is responding to the changing landscape of electrification. And we've learned how to repurpose traditional fueling station to meet future charging needs. And it seems that now more than ever, manufacturers need to work in partnership if they're going to keep pace with technology and demand. Obviously, key to this is an experienced and knowledgeable logistics partner. And remember, this programme, well, it's for you. If you've enjoyed it, then tune in to all of the other episodes which are available online. Just follow the link that's on your screen now. Tune in to episode 6 soon to discover a new era of EV logistics.